Good morning, Helsinki. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. You're all here early. It's wonderful. Well, good morning, Helsinki. So I'm going to talk uh, about an open society. Um, it's a privilege to be here again. Um, and I, I've already mentioned I'm, I started a nonprofit called Open Knowledge 2004, and Open Knowledge uh, Finland is one of the chapters of that, doing an incredible job. I'm inspired to, it's just inspiring to be here uh, at this event uh, on a very important topic. Um, so for those who don't know, Open Knowledge is kind of dedicated to making an open information age. Uh, that's kind of the mission, if you like, overall of open knowledge. And we do all kinds of work. We do advocacy. We do technology building. Uh, we do skill sharing. We build communities. Uh, we do all kinds of work. And a, an event like this is perfect in that, in, that, in that vein. Now, the question that really occupies me is this one. And I think it's relating to the theme of this conference, like who owns the information age? And maybe other, than, I've said biggest question in the 21st century, maybe other than climate, how we solve climate change, I would argue this is the biggest question, policy question of the 21st century. Because in theory, unless something goes horribly wrong, we're going to end up in an information age, in an information economy, where the majority of what we make, trade, and use is information. Um, I was, and that affects us now in all kinds of ways. One example is uh, a close relative of mine, and my uncle, has got, has got ill. Um, and he's got a lung disease, quite a serious lung disease. And there, there's, no, like, there's no perfect treatment, sadly. This lung disease is basically terminal. But you can slow it down a lot. There's recently been a drug invented that will slow down its progress. So rather than, rather than dying maybe in three years, you might die in like 10 years, which is a long time <laughs> difference uh, when you're facing like that. And the thing is, though, this drug costs 60,000 euros a year. It's so expensive that even though in the UK there's a national health service, you know, the state will help pay for medicines until you get sick enough they won't pay for it because they should pay for other things that are more valuable. Now, why my, my uncle is not particularly interested in the information age. He doesn't, he doesn't, that's not what he works in. It's not what he's interested in. But why is that drug so expensive? It isn't the manufacturing cost. It's not, how much, it's not because of the chemicals that are in it or the cost of the factory to make it probably costs only about a thousand pounds, a thousand euros to make that drug, yet it costs 60,000 euros to buy it. I think most of you in this room know the answer to that, which is that we have a system, we have a patent system, and someone is the owner, the only sole monopoly owner of that recipe for that drug, and they can then charge what they, whatever they run. And in general, just to be clear, that's not a bad thing necessarily. If the only way to get this kind of drug in the world was to have that system, well, I'd prefer to have some drug rather than no drug, even if it was very expensive. But it isn't the only way. So this question also is quite old. So this question of who owns information and how we own it is really old. So this is St. Columba, who lived in Ireland about 1,500 years ago. And St. Columba actually ended up involved, even though he was in the church, he ended up in a, in a, in a, in a pitched battle involving about 3,000 people uh, about a fight over copying a book, which was the Bible. Because there was one copy of the Vulgate Bible that had been brought to Ireland, and St. Columba went and illicitly copied it at night in the church. He would apparently steal into the church at night, take the book, and a theory by the light of by 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 light magically flowing from his fingers is the story he would copy out the book. But we do know it happened, and there was a pitch battle about it. So it's a question of who owns information. If you have a book, do you get to control all the copies of it, or is that book it should be available to everyone? It's old. Um, so what we say, and I want to come to this this point of the lecture here is. We think that information should be open. I'm going to come to, though, how we pay for it, right? Because it is costly to make information. It's costly to, 
run all these data platforms, all this stuff. So one is I just want to create, first of all, we're here talking more about personal data. When we talk about open data, we're not talking generally about personal data. Open knowledge does not think that your personal data should be open to everyone. We look at public data. But I think there's an analogy, and I want to come to that to start with here. So the open definition, which defines what openness is for data, says that it's freedom for anyone to use, build on, and share that data for any purpose. So that's freedom to access, to use it, to build on it, and share it for any purpose. That's what open definition says. OK, so we don't necessarily think that everyone, I, I, I think, is there anyone in this room who thinks that we should have open access to all your personal data? There are some people who think that. Ah, oh, that's one person. Great, OK. Um, generally, that's not, so that's, we don't, I, at open knowledge, we don't think the open definition should be applied to personal data. It's applied to public data. But I think there are two sides of the same coin. So you have, Open data on one side, which is public information, and on the other side, you have personal information. And I think these are two sides of the same coin. Um, so in particular, I think we could take the principles that we have for open data and think about how they apply to personal data. So you have these freedoms with, to use, build on, and share data. And for open data, we apply it to public data, and we say freedom for anyone to use it, freedom for anyone to build on it, freedom for anyone to share it. And the kind of story about ownership is we all own all of it. I mean, that's basically what goes on. If we all have access, we all kind of own it. Like, we all have access and own that data. But my data, personal data, is freedom for me to use it, freedom for me to build on it, freedom for me to share on it. And we all own our part. Um, so I think there's kind of this analogy between the two things here. And we could think of those principles. And I also want to emphasize a crucial part of the open definition is about legal and technical. You might have the right to get data but, or even to get public data. And I remember I once did an FOI request, and what I got back from the government was a stack of paper this high. That wasn't very useful to me. It was going to involve a large amount of time typing it back into my machine to actually make it usable. So we understand it's not just legally. There I had the information. I could use it. But obviously, it wasn't actually practically useful to me. And similarly today, often, even for a while, we've had a legal right, in theory, to get access to my personal data in various forms, even before the latest directive in the Europe. But practically, it was not very meaningful. It was extremely difficult to request. It was often would then be delivered to you in paper form. So one of the big things in the open definition, it also says that those things are about both machine access and kind of human, it's legal and technical openness. And similarly for my data, for it to be meaningful, we need technical access as well. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but this is a very important point to make, particularly to policymakers. Um, so I kind of think that we could imagine changing those open data principles into my data principles. So that every person has the freedom to use, build on, or share their personal data and that determine who else gets to do that and how. Now, we could imagine that as the, the analogy of the open data principles, the open definition, but for my data. And this is actually something I and my colleague, Laura James, when we, wrote, we wrote out a post about this in about 2013 along these lines. OK, so I want to come back, though, to the vision. I just want to pause for a moment. I want to give each of you about 20 seconds to reflect on, like, why do you care about this? Why do you care, whether it's about informa open information or access to personal information? Not like, look, it will make a more efficient and effective economy. Like, why do you care about that? What is it that actually motivates you about this? I mean, even if you might say money, like I, this is my job, why do you care about that? I used to teach economic students at the University of Cambridge, and I always encourage them to read more novels. Because, you know, it's like uh, they, they, they kind of wanted maybe to earn money, but they didn't really often know why. <laughs> it's important to know why. 
I'll just, so for a few minutes, seconds, while I'm talking, you think for yourself. I'll give one example for me. So I remember when I was about seven years old, I worked out that my sister, my sister's two years younger than me. I'm the older brother. <laughs> my sister's two years younger than me, so she was five years old and I was seven. And I worked out that she was getting paid more pocket than money than me when I was five years old, Right? So that's quite a thing to work out as a seven-year-old, right? You've got to imagine you're two years younger. It's quite a big mathematical cut. I was quite proud of myself when I worked this out. <laughs> and I was like, this is outrageous. This is unfair. And I remember I went to, I went to my, my father, who happened to be in charge of the fairly small amount of pocket money we got. And I said, this is wrong. This is unfair. Why are you giving her more money than I got when I was five years old? And I think my father hadn't really realized that he was doing this, right? He just kind of upped the pocket money as time went along without realizing the, the difference. But of course, as people probably aware, as parents, you never want to look weak here. You never want to look wrong. So I think my father quickly thought to himself and said, look, I did it intentionally. <laughs> okay? I did this because I wanted to teach you an important lesson, son. Uh-huh. Life is unfair. <laughs> I, I'm seven year old and I hadn't thought of this point. So of course I was a bit dumbstruck and I was like, ah. Oh. And the thing was, I did realize that life was unfair, right? Because I went to school. I don't know if, you know, my encounter with going to school was it was quite surprising to me. Um, I grew up on a farm, I, you know, but suddenly, you know, kids were teased because they were fat. Or some other kid was really popular for reasons I couldn't work out. Some kids were smart and some kids weren't so smart. Some kids always got picked first on the team. Do you ever remember that? Like teams getting picked? I don't know if it happens in Finland. But like, you know, I'd sometimes get picked last. You know, why? It well, doesn't seem very fair, life. You know, So I was kind of very aware that life wasn't very fair. That was apparent, even as a child. So I went away for a week or two. And I was the kind of thing who thought about this. Because I could feel it was just wrong. This was wrong. This wasn't right. And eventually I went back to my father and said, aha, uh -huh. I'm not sure I was quite as articulate as this, but I said, look, you're right, life is clearly unfair. However, you are making it more unfair by active choice. <laughs> you could make it fairer, right? And the point I make of this story was that as a young child, for me, for example, fairness really mattered. A sense of justice about life. Now, clearly, the world is unfair, but I would like to see it be fairer. That, that moves me. That inspires me about things. And in some ways, it's visceral. It's not something that I even is that rational. I can tell stories about it, but it's something that you almost have intuitively. Actually, probably a lot of humans have that intuitively in one way or another. And that's one of the reasons that I care. So I want to say the vision that open knowledge has is of an open world. Now, I'm going to talk, I've talked a bit about how this would apply to personal data. In general, open knowledge has talked about public data. And I just want to set this out to you so you really get this. I want to see a world in which all public, non-private personal information is open. And I would add to that, all personal data, you have a choice as to what happens to it. And creators and innovators are recognized and And when I say all, I mean all. I mean all research, all music, all software, all drug formulae, is open. Now, why does that relate to inequality or fairness? Well, we're inter we've suddenly like entered this magical moment. It really is magic, right? I mean, for thousands of years, probably humans have told stories about unlimited, unlimited amount to eat, right? You know, all those like fairy tales about, you know, some kids find some like gingerbread house and they can eat and eat and there's always more gingerbread. It's like that suddenly happened to us. We are suddenly living in this digital information age where all it takes to make a million copies is a click of a button. That is extraordinary. It's what underlies most of our discussion. It is the greatest change in the technology of production that has ever happened to humanity. It's bigger than the agricultural revolution. It's bigger than the industrial revolution. And it's different from those revolutions. Those revolutions meant we got better at making stuff. And that has had a big impact. But this is actually different. Bits 
can kind of multiply to meet demand. It's really magical. But that world can go two ways. Imagine you have this magical gingerbread. You're in this magical world, and you can make, there's a witch who's kind of got, can make as much gingerbread as needed. All the children in the world can have gingerbread. <laughs> but there's an evil witch. The evil witch can use that incredible magic to become phenomenally rich and powerful. She probably, or he, could be a magi- an evil magician or an evil witch, will deny access to that, to that gingerbread to many people because that way they can make more money charging the princes or the rich merchants for the gingerbread. And they'll let the poor children go starving. And it's a world of incredible concentrated power and wealth. Because you're in this world of magic. Suddenly, if you're the person who controls that thing, you can make an infinite number of copies for free, but you can charge money for them. On the other hand, we can imagine a good witch or a good wizard who gives it all out for free. Then everyone can have as much. It's a world of significant inequality. Of course, the witch might say, or the wizard might say, even if I'm the good witch or wizard, they might say, I need to do my wizardry research. I need to pay off my wizard student loans. Hogwarts is very expensive nowadays. The government have cut funding. <laughs> right? So there is an important question. If I'm standing up on the stage and saying, hey, this is the open world I want, how do we pay for it? And it relates to my data too. All of these visions we have of these platforms and systems, how do they get paid for? Normally, the story is either it's going to be proprietary or you're going to sell advertising. You know, even if it's free, you're basically going to sell people's attention or their data to somebody else, which, as we tend to hear here, doesn't ultimately, I think, a very sustainable business model. So the big question, if I'm coming up here talking about is how do we pay for the first copy? Because I'm not, I'm not going to insult them, but I'm not one of those free tards they're sometimes derogatorily called. You know, people go around and say, man, everything should just be free. We just love everybody. Now, that might be, like, I, that would be a nice world, but, like, in general, we have to have something that is sustainable in the face of some degree of human selfishness. <laughs> we do have to work out how things get paid for, and we coordinate that. So that's going to be really simple, and it's a really, really simple model. This is the open model. By the way, it looks quite like... Um, I'm going to show you in a moment, it looks quite like other platform models we already have in the digital age. So citizens and consumers, normally with the government helping them, pay into a pool. The government helping them is called taxation, by the way. It isn't normally seen as help, but it kind of is. It's helping you pay for public goods. So you pay into a public funding pool. And what I want to emphasize here is that government taxation can be distributed in ways that are what I would call very market compatible. Right? Very demand compatible. Normally, we associate government funding things with the government deciding how that money is spent, even if they do it in a good way. Right? But do you want the government deciding what pop music gets created? Put your hand up if you would like to see that happen. A couple of people there, right? Maybe it would be better, right? Um, but I just want to emphasize, we can have this kind of funding model and distribute that money in, in several ways. You can do what I call upfront, which is traditional, expert select. But you can also do what I call remuneration rights. Rather than having patents and copyrights, which are monopoly rights, if we were to call them by their true name, they are not property rights in any way, they are monopoly rights, we can replace them with remuneration rights. This is, you register it just like a copyright or a patent, you, invent, you come up with a song, you invent a drug, you write a piece of software, and you register your invention, but instead of monopoly, you get paid... You, instead of a monopoly right, you get the right to get paid depending on how much that's used and how valuable it is. And we've got other mechanisms. And I just want an example for you. Right now, we're moving to something that looks a bit like this world, but it's just run by a monopoly platform in the middle. Rather than the government and citizens, subscribers pay into a funding pool at like Spotify or Netflix or you know, even Uber, if you like, or any of these ones. You could even think of Google a bit like this. In general, Google doesn't give any money, to, doesn't give so much money except on YouTube to the artists. Google gets to use all the content on the internet for free, 
they just go and get money from advertisers. Um, but let's say, look at Spotify. You have subscribers, they pay into a funding pool, and then they give it out with remuneration rights, basically. Artists sign up for a deal where they get paid per play, right? There's not really any upfront funding in the Spotify model, and they give out money and profits, okay? So this model works. It, by the way, Spotify are getting rid of monopoly rights, they are churning copyrights into remuneration rights. Once you as an artist sign up with Spotify, you're basically getting a remuneration right instead of your copyright anymore. However, they've moved the monopoly from the monopoly rights part to them being a platform monopoly. That's what's going on right now in the digital age without openness, is we're moving to platform monopolies up the chain. But what's, and there's a load of things wrong to that. You can read at the bottom of this slide, but basically there are a lot of things wrong with platform monopolies. And my point is that we can do it better. For example, Spotify charge about 10 euros a month. You could have universal, open, free access to music in the UK, for example, and pay artists as much as they receive today for 90p per internet connection per month, just about. In, in Finland, it's probably about half that. It's about 40 cents a month per Finnish person would probably pay for universal free access to music, open access to music in Finland. And you could do it for pharmaceuticals. You could do it for software. You could do it for all of these types of goods. Exactly the same model. Right now, for example, in the United States, the government pays for 50% of all innovation and research in pharmaceuticals. So they already pay for the upfront funding. Government already does that with citizens. And the other 50% is funded by patents very inefficiently. And I want to emphasize this because it's related to all the my data platforms. How are they going to get paid for in a way that doesn't end up with them going bad? By going bad, I mean they either sell your attention or they sell your data to someone in a way. And I just want to emphasize this remuneration rights model. Remuneration rights is a way to kind of, it's ownable, it's tradable, just like IP rights, but it's without the monopoly. And we already have this going on, by the way, in music and a whole bunch of areas. And what it does is I think it's kind of the best of, you might say, I don't, I don't know, socialism, capitalism came together and had a child, right? Um, right? Because it has government collected a collection of funds to pay for public goods. It solves the free rider problem. Everyone wants to listen to music, but no one pays for it. But with non-government disbursement, you have the kind of market-oriented model for distributing money. So I just want to end here with the need for politics. Great, at the end of the last presentation, someone, we had this emphasis about power. And I want to emphasize that a lot of the problem in this is not technology. Going back to St. Columba, this problem has been with us for a long time, the question of how we own information. The point is, information is now becoming everything. It's now becoming the biggest question. On the one side, you have basically, if I exaggerate, the hell. If we don't do anything, we're going to get dystopia is the default. If we do not act, dystopia is the default. And on the other hand, we have this kind of utopia, if you like, a world both of inequality, but also performance, of innovation, of creativity, of freedom, a bit like the Finnish education system, right? Equality and performance. But we need politics. At the moment, there's a lot of people in the technological space who kind of, I would say, go in for techno-solutionism, who think that somehow technology will get us around the hard problems of, social, of building social solutions. I meet a lot of them in the blockchain space. <laughs> right? And the sad answer is that won't happen. Collective action problems, politics here, of building the system, of getting collective funding together, is, takes politics, takes us acting as humans together. Technology won't just hack the solution. We won't just torrent everything. No, that won't work. So, to conclude, an open information age, both the personal data front and I would say now the public data front on both sides, would make us freer, fairer, richer, and weller. But dystopia is the default. The gravity of power means that by default, if we don't get together and act, we will get the dystopia. So let's make it happen together. Thank you very much.